and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. You're sitting in a little French restaurant enjoying the onion soup. But it's not the onion soup that brought you here. Rather, it's a prospective client. He asked you to meet him here at La Grande Maison, third booth to the right. Mr. Chambers? Peter Chambers? You, uh, Dr. Burns? That's right. May I sit down? Dr. Philip Burns, tall, black-haired, black-eyed, and he looks more worried than Papa when his teenager hasn't met her curfew. I'll begin quickly, Mr. Chambers. I asked you to meet me here because it's near my office and I can't get away for long. Well, you're the client. Case history, then. I'm married, wife and two small children, who, at the moment and for the next three months, are vacationing in the White Mountains. And I'm a dentist. And you're supposed to have quite a lot of money by inheritance. Yes. Now, about this Grace Chandler. Oh, yes, you mentioned her when you talked to me on the phone. Right. A patient of mine, with whom I've become rather well acquainted lately. I understand, Doc. Now, uh, where do we fit the prosaic private eye into this? Well, about two weeks ago, at nine o'clock in the evening, I was home. My family had already left on vacation, and I was about to go out for a date with Miss Chandler. Oh? I, I saw no harm in it. We were just good friends. Yes, of course. I received a phone call from an important patient, uh, Mrs. Griffin. She said it was an emergency. I asked her to meet me at the office, and I rushed over there. And this is what happened. I got to the office, walked into my operating room, and there was a man, a strange man, sitting in the operating chair. He had a gun in his hand. This is a nice little 38 you got, Doc. Is that mine? It's yours, all right. Got it out of your cabinet over there. What do you want? What are you doing here? I'm going to use the gun, Doc. And I'm going to use it on you. That's what I'm doing here. But, but, but I, I don't understand. You know a Grace Chandler? Yes. I'm her husband. Now do you understand? He rose up out of the operating chair, a tall man with white hair and a white mustache. He lunged toward me and suddenly the lights went out. But I grabbed at him and we fought furiously. And then... Then, somehow, I had the gun. But his, his fingers were at my throat, throttling me. In self-defense, I pulled the trigger. I got up and groped in the darkness. I tried to find my flashlight, but it was gone. Finally, I reached my work table. I, I found smelling salts and used them on myself. Then I stumbled around until I got back to him. And I kneeled down beside him. He was dead. I got up. The gun was still in my hand, and finally I found the phone on my desk and I tried to use it. But that, too, was dead. I ran my fingers along the wire. It, it was cut. I left the gun on the desk and I got out of there. Somehow I got out of there. A block away, I found an open drugstore and I called the police. They used their flashlights, found a loose fuse, fixed it. The lights came on. But there was nobody on the floor. There was no dead body. There was nothing. And my gun... That was gone, too. I absolutely thought I was crazy, Mr. Chambers. Now, look, Doctor, was there a dead man on the floor? No question. That man was dead. Oh, I, I admit to terrible misgivings. I've been trying to get up enough courage to put myself in the hands of a psychiatrist. And you've been wrestling with this problem for two long weeks, huh? Yes. But yesterday, yesterday, finally, I knew that I was sane. Well, because why, Doc? Why suddenly yesterday? Well, I had a new patient, one Slocum Blackstone, who prefers to be called Blackie. That's when I knew I wasn't crazy. I was drilling his tooth. <laughs> Blandly, he said, Dr. Burns, you killed a man, didn't you? 
What? That's what he said. He told me that the police had fished up a body from the river, that the face was battered and the rest in fairly good condition. He said that that was the man I had killed and that he could prove it. So what else did he say? He refused to speak any further. He told me to think about it. He said he'd be back tonight to talk business. Oh, good old blackmail, huh? Mr. Chambers, before I make up my mind on this, I, I want somebody, somebody experienced and somebody trustworthy to advise me. You're that somebody, sir. Huh? Good enough. Now, what time is this blackie coming to your office for that talk? At 8 tonight. Okay, I'll be there at about 7.30. And to anybody, anybody at all, I'm a new patient. I'm, uh... Now, let me see. I'm, uh... Martin Barnett. All right, Mr. Chambers. Uh, Barnett. Anything you say. He gives you a few of the less pertinent facts, like addresses and things, and then the good doctor takes his leave. You order another onion soup, but you're no longer an epicure. Everything tastes lousy to you. So you pay and you blow. You have a short visit with a rich witch by name of Griffin, and it causes a lifted eyebrow. And then you're downtown at headquarters for a chin fest with good old Louis. Well, Petey Chambers, the private Eiffel. Good to see you. Things were getting a little boring down here. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide. Strong sinew of the New York police force. A good cop, a good citizen, and a mighty good friend. Well, you got some crazy questions for old Louis. Things have been rolling so normally around here, we've begun to miss you. <laughs> crazy clients, crazy questions. <laughs> Well, since I pride myself on being a gentleman, I won't add crazy private eyes. Well, got any crazy corpses around your morgue? <laughs> That's my Pete. Never fails. Have you? Crazy corpses. Like how? Oh, like maybe one that likes to walk around after he's dead. Or that maybe has a special passion for stealing a gun from a dentist. You building up to something, Pete. Or that maybe has three bullet holes in him. No face. Just a minute. What do you know about what we've got in the morgue, pal? Don't know nothing, pal. Why you here, pal? Because I love you, pal. Now, look, Pete. Now, look, pal. If it so happens by some peculiar circumstance you're harboring a corpse in your public morgue that meets with the specifications laid down by the uh, private eye, then, as a favor, the private eye would like a look-see in the public morgue. And what else? Oh, a little chop-chop. Chop-chop? You know, talky-talky. All right, trouble, trouble. <laughs> Let's go to the morgue. Talk. A morgue is a temporary stopover for dead bodies. They keep them in refrigerated cabinets. And after autopsy, they're either claimed or buried in Potter's Field. Parker produces the one you're interested in. There's your baby. White hair, smashed up face. You look over the hands, they're the hands of a mature man. Had enough, Petey boy? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've uh, had enough. Let me shove him back. He's our prized possession. Nobody knows him, nobody claims him, nobody identifies him. Fished him up out of the river. Dead by drowning? No, no. Dead before drowning. Oh? Three bullets in him from a 38. And we've got the bullets. They were still in him when we found him. Now all you need is a gun the bullets came from. And whoever owns that gun. Hmm. The only additional information a medical examiner could give us was that that battered face had had a mustache. White mustache. Ah, that's right. A white mustache. Uh, you know this guy? No. Now, I want you to level with me, Pete. Okay, Lieutenant, let us level. I've got a case that might involve our Mr. Unknown. So far, it's confidential, but, well, let me spread my wings a little and I'm liable to fly right back to you. So, at 7.30 that evening, you keep your date. You're seated in the operating chair at Dr. Philip Burns' office, which is on 86th Street. One flight up, and the good doctor is drilling. There you are, sir. Rinse, please. Uh, Janet, would you fill Mr. Barnett's cup again? Yes, doctor. 
Here you are, sir. All in all, I'd say you have an excellent set of teeth, sir. Thank you, but the drilling I can live without. Spoken like a good, normal American citizen. <laughs> Uh, doctor, do you want me to make out a card for Mr... Uh, Mr... Barnett, uh, Martin Barnett. Mm -hmm. oh, Mr. Barnett, my nurse, Miss Janet West. How do you, Miss West? How do you do, sir? Janet West. A tall brunette with eyes like saucers. And going from saucers to saucy. That was her expression. Saucy, pert, and very cute. There's no reason to keep you this late, Janet. I'll take care of the paperwork, the card and things, Mr. Barnett. Thank you, doctor. But if you wish... Uh, no, I'll... no, run along now. Let me see now. By cuspid, upper molar. Doctor, can we uh, talk now? Rather not. She'll be ready to go in a second. Oh, well, here she is now. Good night, Doctor. Mr. Barnett. Good night, Janet. Good night. All right, now, where'd you keep that gun? Right there in that cabinet. Do you have a license for it? Of course. And your flashlight? Right here in this drawer. Uh -huh. Have you come up with anything at all, Mr. Chambers? Well, two things. There's a stiff down at the morgue that tallies with what Mr. Blackstone told you. And I checked with Mrs. Griffin. She never called you that night. Doc, uh, what's in this, uh, room back here? Well, that's my workroom. Connects directly with the operating room here. Will I be able to listen from in there? Oh, sure. Where's that from? Outside the waiting room. What time is it? Eight o'clock. Uh -huh. That's our boy. Okay, lock me in here. That's it. And remember, listen him out and stall him. We're alone, Doc, ain't we? Of course. You think I'm crazy? Oh, not you, Doc. Crazy like a fox, that's you. The way you stall them cops. And you with a dead pigeon here on the floor. <laughs> How do you know? Hey, just listen, sweetie. I own a pool room downstairs, right downstairs from here. Yes? Business, you should pardon the expression, it stinks out loud. So that night, I'm outside getting a bit of the ozone when I hear them shots up here. And then I see you come tearing out, I figure it, for some kind of hassle. So what have I got to lose going upstairs for a gander? You found him here on the floor? Right you are, sweetie. So I figured I could lend what you call a helping hand. I goes down from a flashlight, and then I do the bit. I snatch the gun, and I lug him out of here. And like that, you're guilty of nothing. You know what I mean? Nothing. What did you do with him? Put him in my car and dumped him in the river. And like that, I'm in business. I don't quite understand. Yeah, well, just keep the ears picked up. I got your gun down in my bank vault. And the cops, they got a stiff with three bullets in him, and they got the bullets. If the slugs they got match the gun I got, <laughs> you know what you got? Trouble. By the bushel and the peck. Clear? Yes. So we're going to work it like an annuity. Just what are you selling? Life insurance, sweetie. On your life. And we'll make it an easy premium, $300 a week. For how long? It's a life insurance policy. You pay for the rest of your life. Ain't unreasonable, $300 a week, and you know it. And you can afford it. Think what I'm doing for you, Doc. Yes, I'm thinking. <laughs> you want to hear the funniest switch, sweetie? My one worry in the world is going to be your health. <laughs> Keep well, Doc. And if I don't agree to your demands? You'll agree. You're not one of them big dopes. you got brains, sweetie. Look, I give you a few days to think about it. Monday at five, I show up for my three bills, and then after that, every Monday like clockwork. Uh, goodbye, sweetie. <laughs> See you on Monday. Is he gone? Yes. Uh, a real cutie, that one. Yeah, real cute. What are you going to do, Doc? I'm going to pay him. And what happens when he raises the ante? They always do, Doc. What's your advice, Mr. Chambers? Oh, you mean I'm still working for you? Blackie stated the deadline, Mr. Chambers, for both you and me. You're a good little detective working on a case, so you suddenly remember there's one party who should have been interviewed and who wasn't. Grace Chandler. 
She turns out to be an acrobatic dancer. A good-looking brunette with uh, muscles in her arms. Yes, yes. What is it, Mr. Chambers? Well, just a couple of questions, ma'am, about your husband. Husband? Husband? Well, I won't take up much of your time. I've if got no husband. No husband? Nah. Bye now. Hey, say, where are you going? <laughs> The rest of the day develops nothing. And so the next day, at about 7 o'clock in the evening, you're outside Doc Burns' office ready for a bit of a tail job on Janet West. She leads you all the way to Riverdale. And there, a fine-looking man opens the door for her. And what do you know? He's got white hair and a white mustache. Real nice face. You've seen pictures of him many, many times. Only when you saw them, they had numbers beneath them. Rogue's gallery pictures. The mailbox in front of the house says Michael West, so you get to a phone booth and call down to Parker. Hello, yep. Yeah. P. Chambers, look, Louie, do you remember Mike Andes? The old confidence man? That's the one. Is he still in operation? Not lately. Not that I heard. Well, you're gonna hear. Do you have a daughter, that guy? Yeah, yeah, chip off the old block. Lastly, runs in the family. Well, come and collect them. What? What are you talking about? He lives up at the Marinac, 1897 Belmont Avenue. He lives under the name of West. Pick up both of them, the father and the daughter. Oh, now, look, Pete, way up there, I'd be happy to do you a favor, but I'm homicide, remember? I got more important things to do than worry about confidence. Louie, how's the stiff in the morgue, the one with the bullet holes? Well, he's still stiff, still unidentified, still a puzzle to me. Well, I'm in the process of solving that puzzle, Lieutenant. Well, Pete, you mean... Yes, I mean. Pick these two up and deliver them to the office of Dr. Philip Burns, 86th Street. Pick up Doc Burns, too. Have him there at 10 o'clock. Keep the old man downstairs out of sight till I show up. And don't give anybody any explanations whatsoever. Okay. I'll see you in Doc Burns' office. I'll have the doc there and the girl there and the old man stashed away outside. Goodbye now. Gotta go and get the old horse and buggy. And so close on to 10 o'clock, you're visiting a pool room on 86th Street, and business certainly is lousy because you're the only customer. There's one guy there, tall and husky in his shirt sleeves, and he's got even bigger muscles than Doc Burns' acrobatic dancer. Also, he's got arrogant black eyes that are bolder than a burlesque dance in Union City. Looking for somebody, Jack? You the boss? Yeah, I'm the boss. You Blackstone? Yeah, I'm Blackstone. Blackstone. You know, that was a great jurist once. Jurist? What's a jurist? A judge, a lawyer. Look, sweetie, I got a mouthpiece by name of Rabinowitz. He'll spot your Blackstone ten points, and your boy won't even know he's been in a tussle. Now, what do you want here? You. What? What's that? We're going to do a little talking, pal, about a body and bullets and a river. You the law, Jack? The private law. Oh, Fink. Well, sweetie... Here's what I think of Finks. And here's what I think of muscle guys. Now, get up. Get up, sweetie. Hey, hey, Come on. Easy. Where are we going? We're going upstairs and see the dentist. There's a couple of cavities that need filling. Upstairs, you join the cast of characters, and Parker shakes hands with you. Hiya, Pete. Everything taken care of. Who's your boyfriend? What? What's going on here? They're all there except old Mike, plus a lot of cops. And Doc Burns' eyes are popped like he's studying Grace Chandler's muscles. Mr. Chambers, what's the meaning of all this? I had your word. It, it was in the strictest confidence. That's just what happened to you, Doc. Confidence. Only add the word game to it confidence game. Uh -huh. And there stands number one, Miss Janet West. What? Or whatever her real name is. My nurse? We... You're crazy, ma'am. That's ridiculous. Ah, they figured out a beautiful blackmail deal. They? Who? Lights going out while you're fighting, phone wires being cut in advance, your flashlight disappearing. What about oh. my corpse, Petey? With the three bullets in it. We'll come to that, Lieutenant. Now think, Doc, think. Who knew you had a gun and where you kept it? Who knew where your flashlight would be? And who knew you had an important patient, Mrs. Griffin, that could be used as a decoy? And who knew that you were going out with Grace Chandler? Come on, Doc, think. Yes. 
Yes, Janet, but, you... Doctor, you I tailed her I... home. I tailed her home, and it turns out her father's Mike Andes, one of the top con men in the country. By the way, where is he, Lieutenant? Cassidy, bring up Andes. He'll be here in a minute, Pete. Mm. You, you, you got them all, huh? Now, look, I got conned into this, too. It, it was Mike's idea, all of it. Look, will it help me if I talk? Always helps if you talk. Well, the whole deal was... was... Uh, here's, uh, here's Mike Andes. <gasps> that... That's the man I killed. Thought you killed, Doctor. Just wanted you to identify him. That's all we'll need him for, Louis. Okay, Cassidy, get him out of here. The, the Fink eyeball is right. The whole deal was a plant. Mike got a bright idea after his daughter got this job here. <sighs> or only took the job because she knew the doc was plenty well healed. Oh, you dirty, miserable little squeaker. Where did you get the fall guy? Oh, I picked up a bum off the Bowery. Picked out one that looked like Mike. We brought him here, and Mike pumped three bullets into him from the doc's gun. Then we cleaned up, and me and the stiff were parked in the workroom. Also, we reload the doc's gun with blanks. Hmm. Then Janet called Doc Burns and gave him the emergency bit about Mrs. Griffin, huh? Yeah, Fink. Then right away, hey. the doc comes here to his office, and Mike's sitting in his chair holding the gun and saying he's this Chandler's husband. And during the fight, you turn off the fuse for the darkness, huh? Correct, Fink. Hey, the name's Chambers. Hey, Mr. Chambers. And then in the darkness, after the doc thought he'd shot him and while he was stumbling around, we pulled the old switcheroo. Switched the real stiff for Mike. And the phone wire was cut so that he'd have to go out to make his phone call. Right, uh, Mr. Chambers. Which gives us time to lug the stiff out. We mark up his face and dump him in the river. And the whole deal would have worked except Mike got stubborn. Like how? Well, I begged him to get out of the state. But he figured this one was such a wrap-up, he'd stay home and take it easy. Eh, uh, any time you think you're smarter than cops, you're dumb. On which philosophical note, Lieutenant, I'd say it's time to transfer our transgressors to more appropriate surroundings. Say, like, uh, the who's gal? <laughs> And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zucker, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Ed Begley as Dr. Burns, Leon Janney as Blackie, and Ann Diamond as Janet. It was directed by Fred Way, and this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. with us again next week at this same time for another adventure by Peter Chambers in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.